This video is brought to you by Manscaped.com, the global brand for men's grooming and hygiene products. This month, I am reading every single chapter of Chainsaw Man. Every day I get sent thousands of requests to cover different anime, however, Chainsaw Man caught my eye because of the excitement surrounding it before its anime has ever hit the airwaves. Last week, we covered the first three arcs of the story. It was epic. If you haven't yet seen that, click the link up in the top right. But to cut a long story short, I set out on this journey initially to see if the hype surrounding Chainsaw Man was justified, and upon finishing last week's material, I could safely say that there's more than enough promise and polish in this story to make the claim that this could be the next next big thing. The only question remaining being, can Tatsuki Fujimoto keep it up? Well, let's see. Part 2 of the review starts now. Boobs. Before we dive into this week's video, I want to share with you something our team's been working on. I very rarely release any merch, but we've fallen in love with Chainsaw Man and wanted to design our very own devil character. I reveal to you, Manga Man. This epic design was inspired by all the different instruments that help bring our favorite stories to life. I love this design and it's now available in t-shirts, hoodies, crewnecks, you name it. The last time I put out new merch, it didn't last too long, so if you want to secure your design, follow the link beneath this video or in the description. Katana Devil Arc Alright, so the last time we visited this story, I had some strong suspicions concerning Makima and then, boom, she got shot in the head. So, now I don't really know what to think. Which, along with the way this story is paneled, is by far its best attribute. The way the last arc ended had me gagging to see how this continued, and to be honest, there were some really interesting developments that totally took me by surprise yet again. We've gotten hints about this particular angle towards the end of the last arc, but every villain or devil that Denji and the corporation he fights for faces off against seems to have the same underlying mission driving them in the direction of Denji to steal his heart. And right as Makima was taken out by those Yakuza thugs, Denji gets shot in the face by another member of this unit in the middle of a restaurant with Aki, Power, and Himeno present. This is the first chapter of this video I'm reviewing and already we have some heart-stopping action and wonderfully kinetic paneling by Fujimoto that helps the scene really come to life. This page specifically when Power jumps into action is brilliant at conveying her motion, all the while leading elegantly and naturally into Aki's big attack. Everything about this scene feels desperate and out of nowhere. Himino is down for the count, Power is hamstrung trying to help her stay alive by managing her blood supply, Denji is out cold from being shot in the face and Aki is struggling to stay alive against this new enemy. Someone that we thought was a human, but one that turned out to be this arc's titular antagonist, Katana Man. Or perhaps I'm speaking with unfounded certainty. Okay, so theory time. Now I know what you're thinking. Mark, what do you mean? Surely this is the bad guy. He's got a knife for a face. And okay, look, I hear you. Don't worry. He probably is a bad guy to some extent. But briefly, something I feel less confident about with this story the longer I read it for is, in fact, the judgment of the main character himself and Fujimoto's awareness of how a reader or perhaps myself might be feeling at this time reading the story. At the beginning of this tale, the first arc establishes, of course, the core components of the story. Pochita, the only thing in this world that Denji loved, fittingly becomes Denji's heart, transforming him into to the Chainsaw Man, vowing henceforth to achieve his dream in the name of his lost companion's sacrifice. This is something anyone can get behind. However, in making this rather traditional narrative setup, Fujimoto also snuck in a rather ambiguous dream for Denji to shoot for, which ultimately colors all of Denji's choices moving forward in the story. He wants to lead the most fulfilling life he can conceive of, which, as it happens, is a goal which transforms more than Denji does in this story. With that said, I like Denji, despite him being down for the count right now, all the while Hayakawa rises in the ranks and becomes my new favorite character. I mean, seriously, this guy is cold. With that said, concerning Denji, I, like the rest of you reading along, are wishing for him to achieve his dream. And due to that dream's ambiguity, we sort of get co-opted into hoping that whatever form Denji's dream takes ultimately gets achieved. It's natural for the reader to root for the main character. However, Fujimoto is honestly making me second guess myself here. If this was any other story, I would have felt comfortable looking ahead. But for the first time in a long time, I'm reading a manga, I'm starting to feel uneasy when I consider what Denji is in fact reaching for. Similar to how Hunter x Hunter made me reconsider and analyze the goal of Gon more closely, in Chainsaw Man, while each arc seems to have Denji pulled in different directions for one reason or another, with him learning to love and connect with other people in his life, no matter what, he always 
comes back to Makima. In other words, I feel like Tatsuki Fujimoto is leveraging the tropes and cliches of manga to guide his readers down a particular path. Like Hansel and Gretel were being lulled into a false sense of security in hoping that Denji finally connects to and lives happily ever after with Makima. However, in reality, I feel that something much, much more severe is on the horizon for this guy. And perhaps down the road, it'll all explode in his face. Pun definitely intended, but not for this arc, it's the next one. But I guess what I'm trying to say is that both literally and metaphorically on both sides of this war, the gun devil and his minions versus Makima and her agency are all fighting for control over Denji's heart without any regard for who dies in the process. And speaking of which, I, I was going to call this a battle, but really it's more of an ambush. You feel that in the desperation of everyone involved on the side of Denji, particularly through the likes of Aki whipping out his sword without regard for the very consequences we learned of in the prior arc. And most impactfully, Himeno. This is once again a story of contrast. In the same way the designs betray and work to complement the actions and personalities of these characters, Himeno's selfless sacrifice of herself to prolong the life of the person she loves in Aki is contrasted starkly by the devil she enlists the help of. This beautifully altruistic action is set alongside the utterly terrifying and grotesque looking ghost of hers once she gives her body up for it. Truly, the stuff of nightmares, which I'm sure has led many a reader to ask themselves, how in the name of all that is holy did Chainsaw Man get serialized in Shonen Jump? Apart from the graphic violence, there's also a hefty amount of sexually explicit content. Okay, I, I say explicit, but I mean explicit for a 12-year-old, which is the demographic that the magazine is targeting. But who knows, maybe times are changing. But yeah, everyone seems to be after Denji's heart, and only Denji is left to defend himself after Himeno gave him that chance as her parting final gambit. So many people in this agency have died or are on the verge of dying, but Makima has other plans. Last time, I said that this girl was scary. Now I am saying that this girl terrifies me to my core. Systematically and in retaliation to the Yakuza that attacked her and her agency, she sacrifices person after person atop this weird monastery or shrine area, and in doing so, turns a ton of Yakuza targets into popped blood balloons remotely from God knows how far away. This feels like the most otherworldly, godlike power we've seen in this series, and I wonder if this has any connection to the Gun Devil itself. The Gun Devil is clearly targeting her and her agency, but for what reason exactly, I do not yet know. It could be something as simple as they're the ones targeting the Gun Devil, but I feel like there might be more to that, but who knows. What I do know is that Makima seems to be among those targeted first. Is this because she's the most dangerous? I mean, it sure seems to be the case, but moreover, I wonder what else we don't know about this increasingly interesting interesting and suspect agency Denji is working for. The conflict on the ground with Denji and what's left of his team is brought to a swift resolution as this weird kid and katana man make their strategic retreat. I'll only touch on this for a moment, but I have to say something here because apparently I'm a massive sim for Fujimoto's layouts. Look at how stupidly easy it is to read this layout. Look how naturally our eyes follow this page with Kobani on the 6th and 7th pages of chapter 28. Look at how each panel guides your eyes to the next one in the sequence effortlessly, creating this sense of movement without movement at all. This is the stuff I live for. For those of you that know how much I love and hold Dragon Ball's manga in high regard concerning its layouts, I think I'm ready to say that Chainsaw Man for me so far is on par with that series. This is incredible work. Oh, also, last time I touched on Manscaped, I spoke about how they launched the fancy Lawnmower 4.0, but did you know you can now get all that and more with their brand new Performance Package 4.0 bundle? With a nose and ear trimmer in their new Weed Whacker, it really is the perfect all-in-one grooming kit. For the sake of ease, I'm sure most of us would like to do our grooming in the shower, and so thankfully, the Lawnmower 4.0 makes that possible thanks to its 100% cordless and waterproof design. It also comes with replaceable ceramic blades to maintain that lovely skin safe sharpness for as long as possible. After you get yourself all trim and proper, it's important to keep your skin feeling great with Manscaped's Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant. Just a dollop of this quick absorbing clear drying lotion will keep you protected all day. And hey, if you feel a little musky throughout the day, there's also the Crop Reviver Ball Toner Spray to revitalize your dangly bits. And when all is said and done, just plonk the lawnmower into its handy wireless charging dock and be on your way. It's as simple as that. Head over to manscaped.com today and get 20% off, free international shipping, and two free gifts with your purchase. Your balls and your body will thank you. 
Speaking on Aki Hayakawa for just a moment, within both this arc and the next one, he acts as the heartbeat or emotion of the story. Speaking on this arc specifically, particularly following the initial fight with Katana Man, despite almost losing his life, he focuses instead on what he's lost, which quite elegantly highlights what makes his character a wonderful contrast with the likes of Denji again, causing Denji himself to feel that discrepancy between him and Aki also. However, in reality, Denji too has something Aki should want that is, to live. Denji is happy with his lot in life, and numerous times he alludes to this reality in the story. It's a wonderful, powerful feeling for a character to have. He's happy that he's alive every single day, whereas a large part of Aki's story concerns him being tortured by his decisions as he tirelessly marches like a soldier day in, day out towards his death. In other words, Denji seems to be willing to do anything to maintain the best life he can possible, whereas Aki seems to be tirelessly in search of his way out, in pursuit of his own goal. Within this arc, there's a great emphasis on flashbacks exploring the first meeting and budding friendships with Himino, set alongside sprawling page layouts where he demonstrates what she meant to him, both in action and in quiet contemplation. This character Aki and really these scenes demonstrate a strong conviction that it's trying to communicate as worthy of throwing everything away in attempting to reach said goal. But I'm sure regarding Aki, I'll have more of a chance to talk about that in the next arc. That said, all of this has been quite emotionally heavy and action-packed, so next up is probably my favorite part of this particular arc. The training mini arc. Now that it's become known that the Gun Devil is after Denji's heart for some yet unknown reasons, Makima has seen it necessary to enroll both Power and Denji himself into training to hone their respective abilities and powers. It also acts as a nice tune-up for everyone reading along to see what makes each of these characters tick physically and somewhat emotionally. Prior to accepting them as pupils or playthings as he calls them later on, this rather intimidating individual asks Power and Denji a set of questions probing their individual morality. After some necessary preamble where this scary lad demonstrates his strength and knowledge of their physiology, he gives Power and Denji a chance to attack and upon a moment's notice, the teamwork between the two is apparent. And while Power marching forward without hesitation can be chalked up to her fiend status and really her character in general, Denji's zero hesitation seems somewhat chilling to me. Which again makes me think back to the metaphor that's constantly being thrown around to describe what Denji is to both Makima and her agency, that he's akin to a dog. Dogs? at least to me, aren't born killers, but they can be trained to be. And Denji seems to have lived a life that has sculpted him into this person, or, or Makiba is slowly turning him into someone that cannot value human life like Aki can. Who is, by the way, someone we have now learned has lost the power to wield his fox spirit in battle due to how reckless he was being in the battle with Katana Man, signifying perhaps that even a literal canine spirit couldn't comfortably do what the devil agency expects Aki to do. This is an agency that sees their employees as necessary and probable collateral damage. Aki specifically demonstrates this with their offer to allow him to wield a new devil, a devil that can see into the future, one that says he, Aki, is going to die in the worst possible way. And due to this, we'll give him some of his power in exchange for a front row seat to his own death. How screwed up is that? All that depressing stuff aside, the training with power and Denji is super fun. Dozens and dozens of failed attacks on this special division leader later, and the team of Denji and Power are after trying everything that came to them naturally. And in a cute bit of character collaboration, they jointly come up with a plan. To instead, and I quote, fight him using our minds. With Denji's response to this idea being, like, how cool would it be if we could fight like one of those brainy guys in manga and stuff? This, my friends, is the caliber of strategic introspection we're seeing now, so naturally I wasn't expecting much, but the plan that they do eventually come up with was actually kinda brilliant. <laughs> Overall, despite this operation ending in a big fat loss, this dude gives them props for their efforts, this effort being their best to date. However, it does end with this scary dude lulling them into a false sense of security before teaching them yet again another lesson. Beasts don't trust 
Hunters. Which again, I could choose to read as another indirect suggestion to Denji that he shouldn't trust Makima. The training continues until eventually Denji shows his gratitude to him. And interestingly, this is the last lesson that this individual teaches Denji, who once he shows his teacher gratitude, entices him to never accept him as a pupil ever again. He only trained Denji because he thought he was inhuman, but in this moment, it now doesn't seem to be the case. And he reveals this decision to step away from Denji and Power's training in an honestly unsettling scene between himself and Makima. The subject matter within this scene is that of him questioning Makima's allegiance to the agency, with some wonderful imagery depicting how untrusting and distant she feels to him, ending on an uncomfortable close-up of Makima's face. So, okay, theory time. My theory is... Makima doesn't have humanity's best interests at heart. At least not in the way that humanity and this dude specifically would consider the best interests of humanity. Though I'm sure she does in her own mind think that she does. Through her, we've learned about what makes devils tick, with her being drawn specifically to those like Denji that sounds scary and dangerous. Specifically because the more terrified a particular concept like a chainsaw or a gun can instill into society at large, the more power and influence they potentially could have on society. Makima herself has demonstrated a fascination with power, and she's demonstrated that she herself is capable of some truly horrific acts. This dude asks Makima in this scene if she is on humanity's side. And perhaps, and this could be a stretch, but perhaps he's asking her this because she herself isn't human. And the only reason I wonder this is because this individual, this person that was training Denji, stopped training Denji when he felt that humanity emerge from him. He couldn't treat another human like the way that he's been treating Denji. And perhaps in this instance, he's finding it difficult to trust Makima because she herself isn't a human, or at the very least, isn't showing human tendencies. Perhaps Makima herself has her own ulterior motives concerning influence and subjugation. In the same way she wants to manipulate Denji like a dog, it seems like, particularly in the scene after this where she talks directly with the Yakuza themselves, she tells us as readers more about herself and her value system. She says, and I quote, Your necessary evil is just an excuse to justify your own crimes. Those excuses are unnecessary to society. Which tells me that she's doing everything because she believes it's the best for society. That's a real totalitarian way of looking at the situation when you ignore the context of the scene somewhat and extrapolate it out into a personal belief of hers. It made me wonder what she might actually be capable of as she hands over a bag filled with the eyes of the Yakuza's family members. Perhaps innocent family members. It makes me wonder how many eyes she has on the rest of the world. Pun definitely intended. Or maybe Fujimoto is totally screwing with me and this is exactly what he wants me to think. I don't know. But I digress. Everything that's taken place in this arc from the initial onslaught by the Yakuza and Katana Man to the counterattack by Makima to Denji and Power engaging in training to Makima pushing the Yakuza into a corner all culminates in one final battle between this sect of the Yakuza versus this new special division in the Devil Hunter Agency. One that begins as the new division infiltrates this building. During this section, we as an audience are introduced to a host of new characters, including the likes of the Violence Fiend, the Spider Devil, which looks horrifying and I'm not even scared of of spiders, the shark fiend who, let me tell you, gets very good in the next arc, and finally, the angel devil. A mysterious and unique devil that isn't hostile towards humans, one that if you come into contact with them, will shorten your lifespan. Aki takes the charge with this particular group's infiltrating of the thick zombie blockade. There are, of course, the instances where Aki demonstrates his lack of consideration towards his own well-being, with him coming concerningly close to the angel devil. However, that's not the aspect of this encounter I find interesting. It's instead the description that this is a unique type of devil that isn't hostile towards humans. And again, this is just my theory, but perhaps the level of hostility a particular devil feels towards humans is directly correlated with how scared of that particular concept that devil represents to society at large. For instance, many people are terrified of guns, but not many are scared of angels. And so, perhaps the level of hostility is comparable. Just a thought for now. Aki versus Ghost Devil. The first interesting ruffle to show itself upon the initial insurgents operations comes by way of Hayakawa's both literal and metaphorical confrontation with a ghost from the past. The very ghost devil that Himeno wielded for the benefit of him is now the one he needs to overcome and take down. And it's here I find myself needing to remind myself of why Hayakawa is important to the story. To ground it, 
While the story of Chainsaw Man itself, through the likes of Denji, Power, and Makima, paint a rather nonchalant, inhuman, or silly story, Aki is also there to represent what's at stake, the love humans share for each other, the humanity of this world. With the very message Himeno leaves behind for him to read, cutting not only to the core of his story, but further reinforcing what this line of work, and perhaps world, is forcing him to be. A fearless killing machine. With his zero fear approach literally granting him the ability to slay this devil standing in his way. This is all to say that Aki is perhaps one of the best handled characters I've seen in this story, and one I have adored to follow throughout so far. Denji vs Katana Man As power... Uh, goes off to do her thing, the fight that takes place is actually surprisingly short in comparison to other fights in this series, but that's not to say that nothing of note or interest occurs within. There is plenty, and for me, less is more in this fight. Specifically when we've already sort of seen some of this already, with this being the first rematch of the series, so to speak, for Denji to deal with. It should go without saying that the panel layouts work supremely effectively, in not only conveying the action moment to moment, but also the narrative when it rears its head across the bout. Quote, a beast should never trust a hunter is such an instance of this occurring. This particular phrase that Denji recalls from his training arc acts for the impetus behind his decisive winning blow, luring Katana Man into a false sense of security, seizing his chance to use his chainsaw powers in a way that we've not yet seen, with the panels helping to effectively deliver that surprise to us as readers when we discover what in fact took place. There's plenty of introspective and human moments from Katana Man towards the start of this battle, however by the end, he's used in a way that I didn't see coming. Following their respective fights, Denji and Hayakawa reconvene by the train tracks. In a surprisingly sweet moment of connection, they both get to share in a moment of admittedly immature but much needed humanity and therapy, if you can even call it that. Taking turns to kick Katana Man in the nuts for what he's done to them both over the course of this arc, Fujimoto also makes a subtle nod to the Requiem scene in Hunter x Hunter, only instead of a murder orchestra, we have a Requiem composed with the screams brought on by nutshots. Truly, it's a work of art. And finally, to finish off this arc, we have what all of these arcs so far seem to be ending with, and that's an intimate encounter or excursion with Makima. With this epilogue specifically concerning Denji and Makima's relationship on their very first date. Makima's words, not mine. And it's probably the most we actually get to see of Makima acting as a human being. Following the victory with Katana Man and her poster child Denji staying in her good graces, she now has enough material to locate the gun devil himself, which on its own is interesting, but additionally lends more context to why she decided to go on a date with Denji in the first place. Additionally, and prior to her offer to go on the date together, Denji has a rather strange dream. A dream where he hears Pochita's voice behind a doorway. A doorway that he's told not to open, no matter what. Now, that's some suspenseful stuff right there, perhaps good symbolism that I'm not aware of yet, but the date itself, however, is really strange that follows. Makima is dressed not in her usual severe and uniformed attire. Here she seems like a regular girl and she decides that their date is going to be a movie hopping marathon. Within the night they see three films, two of which they don't really connect to at all, leading Denji to believe that maybe movies aren't his thing. That is until the third film where Makima reassures him that he might like it as she does like this one also. Both of them together crying in the theater share a rather genuine moment in this instance. A moment within which Denji finally starts to feel human. It's intimate, it's kind of nice and it's their best interaction so far I reckon. And just as I feel like I'm starting to understand Makima, the next act pulls the rug right out from beneath my feet and changes everything. The Explosive Mega Waifu Arc Primarily, the story concerning that of Chainsaw Man seems to be following Denji and what he's concerned with in the here and now. He doesn't seem to be someone that's troubled by what looms ahead or by external factors out of his control, but instead by what's immediately in front of him. And due to this, despite the agency having the necessary pieces to locate the gun devil himself, there's little involvement of that storyline in this short but brilliant arc. Reinforcing the notion that this is a story about the manipulation of Denji, it follows Denji's most intimate moment with Makima with another encounter with with a brand new lady in his life 
Reze. And I only noticed this now, but the interaction between the two of them is initiated by her saying he, Denji, looked like her dead dog, to which he then performs a gross but kind of sweet trick to cheer her up. There are so many damn dog parallels in this story. It's crazy. The contrast between this new but budding relationship and the relationship he has with Makima should be abundantly apparent from the get-go. Reze seems to vie for Denji's affection. She compliments him constantly, but I think more than anything else, this story or section feels exceptionally authentic. Reze has a job, she gets reprimanded, she admittedly has flaws, she takes risks, she's forward. Where Makima would feel to me like an alien or robot trying to pass as a human, Reze seems to be a genuine and sweet girl that wants to get to know Denji more. Which makes what happens later all the more crazy. Reze invites Denji into her school after hours to just hang out with him. It feels very intimate, natural, and the way it's shot, lit, and presented through panels feels personal and warm. It's unlike any of the scenes or sequences in this story so far, particularly the ones that he shared with Makima, which is exactly what we need to feel as readers as that is exactly what Denji is experiencing right now too, priming us for this question from Reze when she asked Denji, hey Denji, which would you choose, the town mouse or the country mouse? The country mouse gets to live in safety, but doesn't get to eat delicious food like they have in the city. The town mouse gets to eat delicious food, but runs a higher risk of getting caught by humans and cats. I really like this question. I like it, first of all, because it helps to set up what Rezi ultimately builds herself up to ask Denji later on, but more broadly, I like it because it's the theme that ties the A and B plots together, Denji and Aki's plots respectively. It's a question that cuts to the core of what Denji and all the others want out of life. Do they want it simple and easy? Or are they willing to take greater risks if it means they get a greater reward? And naturally, but to raise a surprise, Denji responds with the town mouse. It's very natural, and I'm sure Fujimoto wants us as readers to focus on Denji being the mouse and what he wants in this instance, and true to form, Fujimoto does keep Denji in line with what he vowed for his dog. To live the best life he can, to fly by the seat of his pants, it's reflected in the answer he gave. However, what I find interesting in this positive dilemma are the two other characters that feature beside the mouse in the story. The human and the cat. Which segues nicely into this. Reze goes off to the restroom following this conversation when suddenly she's pursued by a maniac walking the halls. She runs. She runs frantically up the stairs onto the roof. The storm rages on as the man looking to leverage Reze to get to Denji makes his attack. <laughs> Shit. Speaking an entirely different language, she puts this man to rest. It seems that we've found our proverbial cat in this story of mice. And what do cats do? They stalk. But then Chainsaw Man's resident shark boy shows up to make the damn save on Denji. Holy fuck, that was awesome. Out of nowhere, this story in the blink of an eye or the explosion of a young girl's head turns into a cat and mouse chase, pardon the pun, through the streets of this city as she stalks her prey feverishly. And that brings us to Reze versus Denji. This is the best fight in the series I've seen, and it's not even close. The chase and conflict that stems from this encounter lasts an entire volume, and from the start to finish of this volume, volume six, it's utterly spectacular. Boasting new characters getting to see some of them in the spotlight, some established characters getting involved also, while in addition to finding the space and time for gags here and there, manages to reinvent what a fight could look like in the Chainsaw Man universe by naturally exploring what Denji's powers truly are. Creating for us as readers some of the most bonkers full page spreads that hark back and clearly took inspiration from some of the very best in all of the manga industry. Like this one from Berserk. The composition is practically identical. It's clear that Fujimoto is a student of the past greats of manga, and nowhere is that more evident than in this fight. There's just so much going on in terms of layouts, illustration, and even character. With Reize herself, much like she did during her fake dates with Denji, she teaches him how to better control and apply his powers through examples and misdirection. To tell you the truth, there's so much to this fight that going moment to moment would take me another hour to explain, which my editors and I cannot afford, so I'll try to keep it brief. I think above all else, this arc and really this fight wants to talk about the people that get caught up in the crossfires of war. 
the necessary residual damages or casualties as superpowers or those who make the decisions continue to quarrel and clash. Denji in this arc is nothing more than a well-intentioned, albeit dangerous child, colliding with another tormented soul, the likes of which doesn't know to what degree she has been manipulated. Denji defeats this foe in Reize with the help of Aki, who was willing to throw everything away because, in the moment, he didn't want to take advantage of his comrades, despite those very higher-ups offering him the chances and powers to make those decisions. And in addition to that, Denji, someone who have every opportunity to manipulate or gain some leverage here, chooses not to kill her, chooses not to hand her in, but to see her go free. He chooses this. And moments from making the decision to share a genuine moment with Denji, she, unable to make that connection, flees. And just as the curtain falls on this short but fascinating arc, Makima, never to be second fiddle, never to be outdone or outplayed, enters the frame, cornering Reze. I didn't mention this earlier, but in chapter 41, Makima says something that I found to be quite telling. In that chapter, while talking to Aki about his relationship to the angel devil, she says the following, you don't have to like him, all you need to do is use him for your own benefit. Makima doesn't see people as human beings with feelings or comprehensive understandings of their surroundings, but instead pawns in her complicated game of chess. And so it makes me wonder, was Reze ever as horrible as she alluded to others that she was? She certainly had done terrible things in her life, killed many individuals, and acquired a laundry list of specialities across a no doubt harrowing career working for her superiors. But it makes me wonder, was Reze ever really the cat I thought she once was? Was she the one pulling her own strings, or was she, like Denji, simply another humble, manipulated, and coerced mouse struggling to find her place in the big city? Someone that despite her lies, may have unbeknownst to her had so much more in common with Denji than she ever realized. A mouse that desperately wanted to escape to the countryside. Fujimoto leaves that up to us the audience to judge for ourselves whether that is or is not the case, but either way, Makima stands on another level entirely, towering, uncaring, and merciless above the mice she manipulates, blissfully unaware of what it is she has in store for them. Next week is the last review of Chainsaw Man. I hope to see you there. Thanks for watching.